Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining today. We're going to give it just a minute and then we'll go ahead and get started. And while we're waiting, if you want to go ahead and say hello in the chat and uh, let us know where you're joining from. Hi, Archie. Hi, Todd from Minnesota. Good morning from Texas. Oh, here we go. Okay, Wisconsin, more Texas, Tulsa, more Texas, Quebec, Bakersfield, California, Canada, San Diego, ooh, Greeley, Colorado. Hi, I'm in Denver. Oh, I'm in Parker, but Pennsylvania, Tijuana. Ooh, exotic. Good morning. All right, Nova Scotia, Las Vegas, Dominican Republic, Montrose, Colorado, Western Slope, Minnesota, Oregon, more Texas, lots of Texas, New York City, we got Tennessee, Yakima, Washington, Spencer from Albuquerque, Bermuda, also very exotic, Lisbon, Maine. Hello from Kansas. We've got Virginia. All right, perfect. I'm going to go ahead and get started, but uh, please go ahead, keep saying hello in the chat. All right, welcome to our Upkeep Winter 2024 product release webinar. Thank you for joining today. Um, just a quick note for everybody, there's two different areas you can type into. So the one is questions and one is chat. So right now everybody's typing into chat. If you wouldn't mind dropping your questions into the questions section, it just it's a little bit easier for us to uh, track and make sure that we're responding to everything. All right, we've got more Kentucky. Wilson, I'm glad you can hear now. Um, we've got more Canada, lots more Texas. We've got lots of Texas today. Good morning, Angie. Austin, presumably Austin, Texas. <laughs> All right. Um, very nice to meet everybody again. Thank you for joining. Uh, I'm Natasha, joining from the product team. We've also got Kobe from our marketing team. And a big thank you to Kobe for helping us with all the logistics today. We have a special guest, uh, Ken Asher, our Director of Security and Compliance is joining to talk about some new and exciting things in security land. And then from our product team, we're joined by Nate Parsons, Daniel Binkowski, and then Spencer Nelson. Um, just a quick note before we get started. Uh, we recently introduced 24 by seven text support. So you can see the phone number on the screen um, for your technicians. You know, if you're out in the field and you need help with something, this might just be a really fast and easy way to, to be able to get support or get questions answered. So just wanted to mention that to everybody. And we also recently released our new security trust center. And I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Ken to share his screen, do a little live demo, and uh, also talk about that. All right. Good morning, everyone. All right. All right. So uh, I'm Ken Asher, uh, head of security compliance here at Upkeep, and I'm here to kind of give you a briefing on our recently launched Trust Center and some updates on the compliance front. Uh, our Trust Center, you can think of as kind of your one-stop shop for everything to do with security compliance around Upkeep. Uh, you can find things like our compliance with CCPA and GDPR, our SOC 2 Type 2 report, you can find pen test results, network diagrams, all the things that your security and compliance teams are going to care about when they're evaluating our product for our security practices. There are little blurbs about lots of different aspects of our um, data practice, uh, security practices rather, as well as things like monitoring of our statuses. So there's a link out to our status page here that you can pop out to, information about things like our disaster recovery and business continuity plans. Uh, information about our infrastructure security, et cetera. Lots and lots of great information out here for you um, to understand our security practices. All of this is publicly available with just a few exceptions. Uh, our SOC 2 report, our pen test report, and our network diagram 
uh, we, we require an NDA and this will actually happen through the request process. So if you go to the site, click request access, it'll send me a, a little blurb asking for permission for to, to grant you access to those documents. It'll take you through an NDA process right in, in flight once you've gr been granted access and you can gain access to those docs. So for your security and compliance teams, um, and also if you're just kind of curious about Upkeep's security practices, this is your one-stop shop, findable at trust.upkeep.com. And happy to, happy to have you. Great, thank you, Ken. You bet. All right, if you have any questions, go ahead and feel free to uh, drop those into the questions section and Ken's gonna hang on to, to answer real time as well. Okay, so for today, um, from a theme perspective, we're gonna cover some mobile enhancements. We also have some general user experience enhancements. Then we actually have uh, quite a few new features that are pretty exciting. So uh, two things around mobile enhancements. We've got unlimited work order photo uploads uh, now. And just a quick side note, <clears throat> um, those will be available pretty soon here um, next couple of weeks. There's also some new filtering abilities on mobile uh, to provide usability between parent and child assets. We are introducing AI-generated checklists. Um, we've also got some user in interface and experience enhancements for preventive maintenance. And then a couple of new features, we've got work order start dates. Um, there's some new automated workflow enhancements around being able to trigger activity off of description contains values. And then we also have uh, configurable asset schedules. And then I just wanted to make a quick mention. Um, I know a lot of folks are really excited for custom work order statuses. Those are also in progress, um, hopefully coming by the end of this month as well. So just wanted to, to provide an update there too. Um, as always, different ways to communicate with the product team within both the mobile and the web apps. Uh, there are uh, feedback forums that you can directly submit feedback that comes specifically to the product team. And then we also occasionally send out surveys on an as needed basis. Okay, starting with photo enhancements. So we've done some user experience improvements um, on how you upload photos. And then basically you can now upload photos or you will be able to shortly, you can upload multiple photos at one time. So previously you had to select a photo, let it load, go back, select another photo, et cetera. Um, so just a lot fewer clicks now. And then also we've removed the total picture count cap. So previously um, there was a limit of only five photos. There's now unlimited um, where you can upload as many photos as you want. This is available for all editions, all users. Um, and then the use case is really just when you need to upload multiple photos to a work order. Um, from a key benefits perspective, just a much faster experience as well as you no longer have that cap. All right, next up we have uh, for mobile as well, filtering work orders by the child asset. So now filtering by the parent asset will show the work orders assigned to the children assets. This is another one that's available for all editions. Um, it's really helpful when you just wanna see all of the work for an asset and the asset's children. And the key benefit here um, similarly is also just fewer clicks and being able to get to the information you need more easily. All right, AI-generated checklists. This is really a tool uh, for generating checklists, but it's AI-driven, which is which is pretty, pretty interesting, kind of cool. This is available for all admin uh, user roles across all editions, and it really just helps uh, with quickly generating checklists. It's a great starting point um, of, of just if you, you know, of being able to kind of like get your, your base list of what you want to take care of for something um, and then certainly can modify from there. And then from a benefit perspective, really just helps save time. So you're not starting from scratch. Um, and then also being able to just generate like many checklists uh, more quickly and in a shorter amount of time. All right, a couple of user um, interface updates for PMs. So there's an improved list view configuration kind of see down here in the screenshot 
Uh, in particular, we've got added filters and saved views for this. Uh, this is available for all editions and uh, obviously for man very helpful in managing your preventive maintenance. Uh, from a key benefits perspective, you're going to get more control over column sizing and visibility. Um, there there's going to be the logical filters. And then you're also just going to see more consistency um, emerging across the Upkeep web app. OK, next we've got an automated workflow description contains. So this applies to the public requester form as well as just kind of the native work order description field. Um, automated workflows are only available on the Business Plus plan, so just a side note there. And for use case, uh, forms submitted by requesters can now be incorporated into an automatic workflow to trigger a variety of post-action conditions. So you can basically search on a specific keyword um, and then automatically trigger lots of different automation. And then also, again, just to point out, this also applies to the native work orders description field. Um, from a benefits perspective, just lots of increased automation and really reducing that administrative burden um, as well as improved data hygiene. Okay, just a, a quick note on the custom work order statuses. Um, again, coming soon. So just being able to reflect the true state of a work order, um, as well as being able to really just customize or tailor the statuses to your specific business's needs. Then we have work order start dates. Um, so this is uh, the ability to define a start date on a work order. And then you also have some nice flexibility around things like filtering and sorting work orders by the start date. This is available for all editions. And from an application perspective, um, it just helps to really clearly identify when work needs to start. You can also work backwards, for example, from a deadline. And it's also really helpful if you have work that is expected to span multiple days. Um, and then for benefits, it's really just better scheduling and detail related to when the work actually needs to be performed. All right, and then lastly, we've got our configurable asset schedules. So you can now define a schedule of operating hours um, per asset, per day, per week, et cetera. <clears throat> the up and down time percentages and calculations will automatically adjust and incorporate that asset schedule. You can also adjust a date range for asset availability, and you can also assign these schedules to assets in bulk. Um, this is another feature that's available on our Business Plus plan. And the use case is basically, you know, not all assets operate on a 24 by 7 schedule. Uh, maybe most assets don't actually operate on a 24 by 7 schedule. So now we just have the ability to really customize and tailor for your specific business's needs and then also calculate and track that downtime against the said schedule. Um, from a benefits perspective, you can now view the availability of an asset compared to the expected hours of operation. Um, and then you can also adjust the date range up and down for downtime percentages. Okay, and with that, I'm gonna go ahead and hand over to Daniel to demo some of our mobile features. Hello, everybody. All right, I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, so I'm gonna demo the photo enhancements first. Um, let's go over here to my mobile app. Uh, so if I go into a work order um, and I go to edit it, um, we made some UI UX changes as well. So you'll see this kind of nice big add photo section. If I click this, I'll have a few options. I can you know take a photo immediately or uh, add from gallery. So we'll pick that. And then I'll get my gallery here. And if I long tap, so if you hold down, it'll check a box and then you can kind of select as many photos as you want. Um, so we'll just do a bunch here, hit select, and we can upload all of those at the same time now. Um, so in addition to be able to select multiple, we also removed the photo cap. So it used to be a work order can only have, I believe, five photos on it, and now there's essentially no limit. So um, this works on web as well. So we'll even if you upload one five, like we'll display all of those on web uh, as well as on, on mobile. Um, so yeah, just kind of 
a lot faster now if you're you know trying to add a lot of photos if you have manuals you know pages of manuals you want to upload or just reference photos for um, technicians doing the work um, it's just a lot easier to do that now um, moving on to uh, the next feature is this is a small one but just making it easier to filter work orders uh, that include child assets um, so kind of going back over here back to our uh, work order view um, when I go into filtering, um, if I filter by assets, it used to be where, um, and I can give you an example of this, it used to be where, so this uh, Heister gas forklift, for, for example, you see it has one child asset. If I filter by this, um, it only will actually show me, oh, let me remove, um, assign to me. It'll only show me the work order work orders for that parent asset. Um, it won't actually include the child. I'd have to, you know, add the child separately. And we made that a lot easier now. So uh, you'll see this toggle here, auto select asset child. So if you have this on, whenever you select an asset now, it'll also just auto select all of the children. So you can see it added this gas tank child asset. So now when I filter, it'll include, you know, obviously all of the work orders related to either the asset or the children as asset. So another small, just kind of quality of life, um, hopefully save save some time um, so you can see kind of the full context of work for an asset and, and its sub-assemblies or its, or its related uh, pieces. Um, cool. So that's everything on, on mobile. Uh, and then the last one is the AI generated checklist. So this is live as of yesterday. So you can go check this out yourself. Uh, so this is only on um, the web application. Um, and when you go to create a checklist, so go to add checklist, you'll see this kind of new box here that says AI uh, checklist generator. And there's a few fields. So um, asset type this is basically what you're, you know, want to create the checklist for. So uh, let's, uh, created for a Ford F-150. Um, right now we have this limited, uh, just kind of a few brackets of tasks. We'll probably open this up in the future if you wanna generate longer checklists. Uh, there's some options for how often this will, you know, slightly affect what kinds of things tend to be included. Uh, so just go monthly for now, and then also checklist type. Um, so again, this will like slightly affect like what sort of tasks you're getting. So let's just pick preventive maintenance. Um, so we'll generate this now. Um, and uh, as Natasha was saying, you know, this, this is just nice to have a starting point. If you're, you know, creating a lot of checklists, it might save you some time, or if you just kind of want to, um, gut check, you know, your own checklist, this could be helpful. It's obviously not going to have, um, it's going to be pretty asset specific, which you'll see, but it's not going to have, you know, the full sort of detail and expertise, you know, that you would have. So it's, you know, probably not something that you're just going to use, you know, 100% on its own, but you're, you know, going to come in, add additional detail, um, you know, maybe it missed some things that you want to add in there. Um, but hopefully it'll save some time and also just, you know, give you an idea of, of what direction you're headed. Also, you know, if you don't have checklists and you're like really want to build out a lot more detailed tasks for some of your work orders, your preventive maintenance, um, it can be just a good starting point, right? Um, like some of these you could use out of the box as, as you know, it's better than nothing sort of thing um, as you like learn what you need. Uh, for your organization. So, you know, we can see there's a lot of, you know, asset specific things like, you know, it's talking about tire pressure and inspecting the tires, uh, fluid levels, battery terminals, et cetera. So, you know, again, like it's not going to have, you know, maybe down to the exact like, oh, what should the tire pressure be? That would be something, you know, you need to use obviously your expertise um, um, to add in. But again, I think it'll be a really good starting place. And this is something we're looking to, you know, continue to iterate on and improve in the future. Um, you know, we're, we're really trying to, we try to leverage technology here, obviously at Upkeep and uh, be innovative. And, and this is kind of a, you know, a, a step in that direction. So excited to get feedback from you all um, uh, on this, on this kind of cool new feature. Uh, all right, uh, that's everything for me. I will stop sharing and hand it over to Nate. Awesome. Thank you, Daniel. So I'm going to share my screen now. Great. So the first release that I had to show over here is our uh, updated preventive maintenance UI. Um, th this has been enabled for all of you. So you, you should have seen this if you've come across the PM module in the, in the past months or so. And really what we did here was to bring consistency with our other modules, such as parts and inventory and purchase orders and uh, consistency between them. So <clears throat> with that, we also got some added benefits of these newer components. Uh, we had a lot of feedback that because uh, our previous 
list view grid here was not able to scroll horizontally. You could only get so much data packed into this. So we now have the ability to scroll horizontally. You can expand all of your columns and um, very easy to navigate which columns you want to select and how, which order you want to do there. And then we also got in the saved view. So just like we have in some of the other areas of the application, now if you want to say uh, filter on something for assign to, and you can save that as, <clears throat> as any type there. So it just makes it easier for you to come in and switch between these, these predetermined filters. I don't have anything for that one. Um, and then come in and it reduces that ability for you to have to go in and, and navigate around here. Alternatively, we also added in a few new uh, filters here so that way you can search based on uh, the teams and, and who they're assigned to and categories and everything like that. So um, really functional for you to come in here and, and compound between those. The next one I'm going to show, which I'm really excited about, is actually our request uh, additions here into our, excuse me, the description um, additions into our automated workflows. So I'm going to start in the automated workflows here. And <clears throat> as you can see, we have the, um, I'm going to go ahead and create a new one. And this pertains to both work orders and requests. So I'm going to start with request is created. And now I have this option for request description contains. And what this allows me to do is actually type in any keyword or string phrase and then trigger any of the actions based on the request is created. So uh, we have this both for requests as well as for work order. So that way we can base the description off there. And really what I like to use this for and what I recommend it is actually for the submission of those requests because some of that information in our custom form fields, as well as the submitter information from public requests, it actually auto pushes that information into the description field. Um, I have one pre set up here, so I'll just give an example here, but um, this is to actually set your asset status based on if a request is created. The description contains this string, and this is actually from my custom form multiple choice option. And when somebody actually selects that multiple choice option of yes or no here, then I can trigger the asset status to be modified from this. Now, obviously you can change, you can assign anybody to those requests. You can add checklists, you can approve any of those automations that you'd like to do. Um, but now it's basing it off of what is actually contained within that description field. So I'll go ahead and give a, quick show of this. <clears throat> um, actually, real quick, let me check which asset I need. All right, CNC machine 21 is operational today. If I go in and create a request and say the oil is leaking, um, none of my other fields are mandatory right now. If I can come in and select that machine and I have this one that's marked mandatory and I select, no, this asset is not operational right now. Once I submit that request, it is pending. And if I return to my assets, I can see that it now took on that asset status, right? So this is just one indication of what you can do with that automation. Again, it can be based on assigning, adding checklist, approving, any of those things. Um, and this is just the uh, very specific line that actually pulled in for, the, um, for that question. You can also base it off of any other phrasing such as failure or uh, whatever other codes might be input into the description there that really works for your business. And that's all I've got for you today. I'm gonna pass it over to Spencer. Hey, good morning, everyone. Let me get my screen shared here. All right, so I'm going to walk through two different things. And the first thing is work order start dates. So work order start dates are really a way to, to have more control and flexibility over your planning. Uh, previously in upkeep, you had a due date um, and a due date only. But this doesn't work in the case where, you know, 
if you have a drop dead due date and you know that you need to start maybe three days ahead of time in order to meet that drop dead due date, there's no way of indicating that in upkeep. So now you can come in and when you create a work order, you'll see a field here for start date above the due date. So I can say that, hey, this work needs to be started on January 17th because you know maybe it came in as a request um, you know, from, from someone that you sort of have like an SLA with or something like that, that, you know, it needs to be completed on the 19th. Um, but in order to complete it on the 19th, you know, maybe you have some capacity to go work on the 17th or, or you know, you know, it's going to be a two day job or something like that. You can set that start date. From there, once you go ahead and set the start date on a work order, you can see here that it, it'll be listed again above the due date. Uh, in your work order list, you will be able to see the start date. If you aren't seeing it right away, it might be that you need to go in here to your customize area and click that and add the start date field. If you see it unchecked like that, it won't be visible. All you have to do is check it and apply. You can click on the start date column header to actually just sort you know your list by that. So if you want to sort of see like, hey, what's you know I'm, I'm already behind the gun here on, on some of these things that should have been started uh, yesterday. Uh, and lastly, you can filter by start date as well. Uh, and this filtering should work like any of your other date filtering. You can either you know, set a range, uh, which would then just give you all work orders within that start date, or you can leave either end of this range open. And this will just say like all work orders that have a start date before January 31st, or in the opposite case, all work orders that have a start date after January 1st. And that is that for start dates. Uh, next up, I'm going to talk through custom asset schedules. Uh, so the purpose of asset schedules is really to define a set of operating hours that you expect your assets to be available. Previously in upkeep, uh, we did sort of downtime and reliability calculations based on a 24 hour a day, seven day a week schedule. Meaning that if you had an asset that you, know, you have an operational schedule from 6 a.m. in the morning until 10 p.m. at night, um, say you had some downtime that begins maybe at 8 p.m. in the in, in the evening and, and carries over into the next day. That's going to record downtime, you know, through the night um, and will reflect your your operational uh, uh, percentages accordingly. Um, you know, what we heard and, and learned was that for many of you, you, you really want to understand when was my, like what percent of the time was my asset available while I was expecting it to be available. If it's unavailable in the middle of the night and we weren't sort of counting on that asset for production timing or anything like that, that doesn't necessarily factor in the same way as if the asset isn't available throughout the day uh, when we're relying on it to, to actually produce some things for us. So the way you can build asset schedules is uh, when you come into upkeep, and go down to your settings area. And for some of you, you might not see this if, you, if you're following along in your own instance, you might not see this right now, but it will be enabled in your account, you know, by, here by the end of the day. Um, so if you're, if you're not, just go ahead and follow me here. So you'll come over to your settings section and in the assets module, you'll pop over, you'll, you should see a new tab here that's called operating hours. In your operating hours, if you already have some built out, you'll see the ones, the schedules that you already have built out. You can click in to any of those to actually see you know, what hours and days are defined. But for most of you, when you first come in, you won't see any schedules yet. So what you'll have to do is create a new schedule. You'll give that schedule a name, and then you'll pick which days you want to, to find some operational hours. So if you do not check a day here, like if I don't check Sunday, that means that, that I'm sort of saying that there are zero operational hours on Sunday. So, you know, any downtime or, you know, if, if I have a downtime event that lasts through Sunday, it's not actually going to track any downtime on Sunday because I wasn't counting on that asset to be operational at that time. Uh, on any given day, you can either set up, a, you know, an entire block of time. So maybe 8 a.m. to 8 p.m or you can break up the day into you know, smaller blocks of time. So maybe you have a shift that runs from 8 a.m. to um, 10 a.m. or something like that. Let me, sorry, 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. Oops. Uh, I'm gonna figure that one out. So you have a block there. Then you could have another block that begins, you know, maybe at 11 a.m. and that extends out to 3 p.m. 
you know, and you can add as many blocks as you need. And this will help account for things like shift changes or just like natural breaks in the day where, where you sort of know that, hey, that asset isn't going to be operational during those hours. At any rate, once you build out your schedule and define the, the, the operation hours for every day, we'll go ahead and actually just create that schedule and you'll see it appear here in your list of operating hours. From there, you'll go into upkeep and you'll go into your assets. And you know, as you're either creating a new asset or, ex or updating an existing asset on the create or edit page, you'll see this section here that says operating hours. And on your operating hours section, if you have operating hours already assigned to that asset, you'll see them appear. You can remove it and add a new schedule here. So I'll add our webinar schedule and say changes. So that's how you assign an asset a schedule. I won't demo this, but I'll just I'll just call out that you can also bulk assign uh, schedules and assets here in the import function. When you do an import, when you download that template, you'll see a column called asset schedules, and you'll just define the name of the operating schedule that you want to assign to each asset. So you know, for many of you, it's likely that if you if you use a schedule, most of your assets will be on the same schedule. So you can go in and, and update all of those in bulk as opposed to having to do it manually one by one. Uh, okay, so last thing I want to show is actually just how this schedule works in practice. Um, so I have an asset that I've already created and has already been on a schedule for some amount of time. Um, and you can see here at the top, I'm seeing the last seven days of, of reliability. I have 100% uptime and 0% downtime. I'm going to check my downtime log and I can see that the last downtime event I had was here on December 24th. So it makes sense that I'd, I'd have 100% uptime over the last seven days. I don't actually have any downtime in that range. However, I am gonna go ahead and look at this downtime event here, which started at 9 a.m. on December 21st. Before that I do that, I'm gonna look at this asset schedule and I can see that this is on a testing schedule. I have that schedule pulled up here. Um, so this schedule in general operates from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. So I would expect that on, on almost any day, except for maybe Monday, you know, I have 12 hours of asset availability for, from, from it during that time. So going back to this particular asset, if I update my downtime range, and here I can, I can update between some preset values, or I can pick a custom range. And for the sake of, of kind of just showing this uh, asset schedule, I'm gonna pick a custom range, and I'm just going to look at very specifically that day of December the 21st. Now, as I update that, I can see that my percentages have now updated to say that I have 0% uptime and 100% downtime. And again, that's because I had 12 hours of downtime that started at 9 a.m. So according to my schedule, this was a Thursday, 12 hours of downtime meant that this asset was down for the entirety of my operational hours. If I were to do something like update this range to be from the 20th to the 21st, now you can see that my up and downtime percentages have updated to 50-50. And that's because I didn't have any downtime on the, 20, uh, on the 20th, but I had essentially a full day's worth of downtime on the 21st. So now I can see that you know within that range, I was half available and half not available. You have different ranges you can pick from here, last 90 days, last 30, 180, 365, uh, but it will default when you first arrive on this page always to that last seven days. And that is just about everything that I have to show. So I'm going to hand it back to Natasha. OK, great. Thank you, Spencer. All right, we'll go ahead and open up for just general Q&A right now. Um, I am going to try to grab all the questions that we have not answered yet. So first one, is there a way to print off the checklist? We may have, Daniel, is there a way to print off the checklist? Not exactly. Um, if you add it to a work order and then export that work order as a PDF, I think you get some of the checklist data. That's interesting though. I can see how that would be very useful. Let me make a note of that. We can look into adding that at some point. I like, that makes sense. I assume the use case would be, um, you just wanna print it out so that your team on the floor, if they maybe don't have access to their device could use it. All right, we've been trying to answer all the questions in real time that have been submitted. So if you have not taken a peek back, um, please do so. I think we've got most of these answered. 
Natasha, I'd like to call out the the one from Victoria. Um, says the yes. December fifteenth web update released a serial number field for assets. Been using this barcode field for serial numbers. Can you explain the reasoning behind creating the serial number field and if it's worth moving barcodes to the serial numbers? That one's for Spencer. Yeah. So. Uh, Victoria, the, the purpose for that serial number field was just to have more of a, a default field there. Uh, what we found is that many of our customers were creating a, their own custom field called serial number. So, you know, just kind of uh, more of a, a quality of life thing for, for new users of upkeep that, that now that field just becomes available out of the box. Uh, I think that uh, the barcode is useful because that is what gets tied to your QR codes in upkeep. So when you're trying to scan things from the mobile app, um, you do that is referencing the barcode field there. So, you know, some people, some of our, our, our customers use the barcode as kind of like one number and the serial number as a separate number. They're not kind of the same thing. So for you, if they're the same, it probably isn't worth to have both. Like if you just have it in the barcode and, and your team knows that that also is the serial number for that asset, probably okay to just leave it in the barcode. Um, but for some people, they have a custom barcode that's different from like the actual serial number that's provided, you know, by the manufacturer on the asset. And so there's now two different places to track those those things. Uh, and Spencer, is the is asset schedules available? Is it coming today? Yes, yes, it's, we just need to okay. enable it for everyone in their accounts. Yes, sorry about the confusion there, folks. Let's, let's say by tomorrow morning, <laughs> just to be safe, but. Okay, but everything else except the mobile is available, should be available um, currently, and then mobile is coming on the 24th. And another one came in from Frederick concerning PM triggers that I'd like to answer. And he asked, how can we pause the generation of work orders during a shutdown, such as holidays? And uh, we do allow that today where you can actually go in and pause your PM triggers. Um, so what that will do is prevent it, obviously, during that holiday schedule. And then when you're coming back, once you hit resume, it's uh, it's only a, a, an immediate action. So it immediately pauses and prevents those work orders from generating in the future until such that you actually go into resume. And that is uh, it is individual per PM right now. That's something that we are we're working on getting so you can do it in bulk. Uh, but that'll be in that top right ellipsis menu on the actual PM detail page itself. Okay, we've got a question from Paige. Can you only expand the lines to see more information on the asset category or on work orders as well? Do we need more information? I think we're going to need maybe a little bit more clarification uh, on that one. Are we talking about expanding the line? Uh, yeah, I, th I think I think if we could get a little more detail on that one, it would be helpful. Um, oh, okay. I think I understand. On the asset page in the detail section, if you have you know a, a lot of text somewhere, you have the ability to actually expand and see all the text. Uh, I don't think that's available on, on the work orders section, although I think in general work orders should just show you all the text. We're going to need to dig into that one a little bit. I think that came from Paige, so we're going to have to dig into that. Um, but if you, if Paige, if you could send us a little more information, that would be helpful. Okay, if you, is the uh, question from Daniel, is there a place to put if you're not able to do the PM at, the, at that time so you don't have to answer the checklist? Um, yeah. Can you say that again? Let me find that question. Yeah, is there a place I think I think it's asking like maybe like a pause or a hold status. Is there a place to put if you are not able to do a PM at that time, so you don't have to answer the checklist? Um, got it. I I'd probably use the work order status for that. Like put the work order on hold and like add a comment of like what the blocker is. Um, like the checklist won't go anywhere. If you want to complete the work order without doing the checklist, um, I mean that that's a thing right now. We're we're working on adding like required fields actually, which would kind of solve the inverse of that problem. Um, 
but yeah, I, I, that might not quite answer the question, but I, it's from what I understand. I think another option here too is potentially have your uh, selection options for those tasks include something for deferment as well. If it's not going to be, you know, if, if it's a yes or no type type answer or pass fail, um, just adding in further options there can allow you to complete out technically that task update, but not uh, not necessarily record a, a status there. Those might be a two good options for you, uh, Daniel Cowens. Okay, Nate, can you take a peek? Angie's got something about PMs in the questions. That's probably right up your alley. Um, question from Nadia, Nadia: Is there a mobile app for the mechanics to use if they aren't using if they aren't near a computer? Yes, absolutely. Um, Nadia, if you just if you either go to our website or if you go to the um, iOS app store or the Android app store and just search Google, you should have a free download available there. Um, yeah, the, and the mobile app is kind of catered for technician use. And yeah, we support both Android and iOS um, and we're releasing you know new features on there all the time. Daniel, do you have any plans to add a purchase order menu option on mobile anytime soon? We don't in the near future. A lot of the purchase order stuff we kind of view as, you know, being on the more of the admin side and we tend to fit, you know, a lot of our admins tend to use desktop over mobile, though obviously, you know, a lot use both. So we're not planning on anything in the near future, but um, I'll make a note of the of interest in that. Okay, let me. There was a uh, question from Vilma. She asked, um, "Is there a way to get to put notifications on? Oh, sorry. Is there a way to get notifications on the items that get put on hold as a follow-up reminder to the admin?" Uh, sorry, Kobe. I think I missed it. This is uh, if the, if we can get notifications for on an item that gets put on hold. Um, a work order? I believe so. She, she wants some um, follow-up reminders to, to go to the admin. Got it. Uh, not natively at the moment. The best I can think of off the top of my head would be that um, if you are in a Business Plus subscription, you have access to the Upkeep Analytics uh, platform. And through that, you can build reports uh, and you can have reports that are automatically sent to your email. You know on some cadence, whether that's every morning, every week. So you could feasibly build a report that has all of your on hold work orders and have that delivered to your inbox, um, you know, uh, every morning or you know, whatever cadence you want. Um, please reach out to, to us for kind of support if you need support building something like that. But um, we do not have sort of a native function that will send reminders to you that a certain work order, you know, is yeah. on just to also touch there to make sure that the notification settings are, are set for those work order updates, because that will show when the status has been changed of them as well. Um, so the users will get those emails, but yeah, it's not specifically a reminder function as Spencer mentioned. Okay, couple from the main chat. Um, I would love, from Brianna, I would love the option to be able to communicate with work order requesters with comments or updates on their requests. Is this something that will be implemented in the near future? Um, we do not have plans for that in the near future, but we will add that to the, the greater uh, list of requests and backlog. Uh, next question from Emily, in the asset details, can you add a separate entry for the serial number? And can we display more photos there? Right now, it only shows one photo. So Emily, there should already be a field, a specific field for serial number on the asset page. When you create an asset, you should see serial number. Um, if you're not, please let us know, but you should see that. Um, secondly, Right now, no. The answer is that you can only have one photo. Well, I guess maybe that's not true. I think you might be able to upload more than one photo on an asset. Um, let me look into that, and I'll pop back in here in, in just a moment. OK, question from Sean. I have an administrator who has left the company who is attached to assets and PMs. 
what's the best way to replace this user with another user? So at that level, uh, it depends on the quantity. If it's only a handful of PM triggers, you can certainly go into uh, go into those records and update the assigned to information manually. Um, if it's a if it's a large quantity, then you would do that via the import, and so you would export your PM triggers and really just use the PM ID and the assigned to, uh, I believe, assigned to email, and just overwrite. Um, their information for that one. So it would change the assigning from that point forward. Okay, question from Dylan. I'm an admin user and unable to customize the categories or statuses. Should I reach out to the help desk for further assistance? Um, the statuses, Dylan, will be coming soon, hopefully by the end of January. Um, as far as categories go, yes, I would say go ahead and reach out to the help desk. Just a quick update on the question around uh, asset images. There is a, a one image limit right now on assets. So um, please drop us some feedback and, and let us know that you'd like to see more if that's something that's important. Just to clarify, you can add multiple files on an asset, but when, but when we say the image, we're sort of talking about that thumbnail image that represents the asset itself. Right now there's a, a one image limit there. Okay, question from Dillard. In the location under floor plans, can you or how do you make it full screen? Dylan, I am pretty sure that it is not possible to make that that image full screen. I think maybe the best you could do is just zoom in on your browser and you should zoom in on the image, um, but there's not sort of a, a way to, to have the image itself take over your entire screen. Okay, question from Paige. When adding a file to facility locations, we have noticed we can only see via web and not via the mobile app. Is that true or is that, uh, or am I doing something wrong? Is that in incongruent functionality? Daniel, do you know if we can see files for facility locations on mobile? I'm not 100% sure. Check. Okay, more questions about custom statuses, um, hopefully by the end of this month. And we will be posting information about that um, via LinkedIn. We'll do kind of like a mini demo recording of that. It'll be on our normal release notes cadence um, and we'll do an in-app notification as well. And Natasha, a few questions came in about, will people be able to rewatch this? And I do believe that this gets, a link will be sent out to everyone. Yes, you will, you will automatically get a recording of today. Uh, yeah, we don't currently show files, just following up on that question, uh, on mobile for locations. Um, obviously we do on web. Um, that's a good call out of just like a small discrepancy there. I'll, I'm gonna add that to something we'll look into. Great. And two more just came in that I'd like to answer. The first one, um, Kristen Pennington just asked, there's a way to put the start and completion dates uh, automated based on the priority of the work order. And this was actually something that we announced in our, our last release webinar, where the automations will allow you to set the due date based on a priority or a category of any of those. Um, so that same concept of going in and if a request is created and a priority is high, then set a due date within a time frame of that. Um, the start date has not yet been incorporated into the automations yet, but I imagine that we will follow suit with a lot of those functionalities. Um, Kristen, please feel free to reach out to me if, you, if you'd like more follow up on that. Uh, and then for Michael King asked if there's a way to assign multiple assets to a work order or PM. And what we can do for that is have uh, multi-asset PMs, but those will generate a single work order per asset. Uh, we do not allow multiple assets on the same work order uh, for all that work to be done. So that way we can retain the kind of work order connectedness to, uh, to an individual asset at that point. I hope that helps. Let's see, could somebody please drop the link to our um, our complimentary or free uh, certification for training for Susan? 
Yep, I, I did actually put that into okay. the chat as well. If anybody is also looking for it for upkeep certified, and this can also be found on the um, the help section of our app as well. Um, so help dot on upkeep. And there's a few few different options there for you to go and find um, lots of different trainings that are very helpful. Okay, is it possible to add currency for Switzerland? I don't believe we support currency outside of dollar today. Is that correct? No, that is not correct. We have uh, lots of different currencies. Um, I think that one is actually on a list that I have that uh, should be getting worked on relatively soon. Um, I'll go ahead and reach out and try to make sure that we have the, uh, the appropriate currency there. All right, Freddie asks, can you add an order quantity to a part using a min-max order quantity? Freddie, right now, um, we, we support a minimum quantity on parts, but that is the only thing. So there's not a way to, to sort of track a, an actual order quantity. Um, you'll have to sort of do that math on, on your own. But it is something we're looking into, particularly the max quantity um, option, which should theoretically help you. You could kind of look at the, the quantity you have in stock max quantity and, and then know how many you need to order kind of to get up to that that amount okay do we offer qr code asset tags for sale oh yeah i was just responding to that one in chat uh so michael we don't actually offer them we do have a few uh vendor uh like preferred vendors for them but realistically any single one that you go on and Google of, of asset tags, uh, if you just provide your that that uh, CSV file for them, they can produce you a really nice QR asset tag as well. Um, the QR code is all going to be generated based off of that that barcode value or whatever you have in upkeep. So it doesn't matter who produces it. The the actual uh, QR code will be the same. Okay, I think we've got a couple more questions trickling in here. All right, Catherine asks, can you make price changes on the fly to POs? Right now it's too many steps and takes way too much time. Yeah, Catherine, as of right now, uh, there, there isn't from what I believe your question is to, to just alter that price. Um, we, we do have one feature in the works, which will allow us to make some changes to some of those prices yet, We're not yet uh, announcing that fully. Um, but I'd love to get your feedback of the use cases of how you'd expect to change those prices. Uh, if you could email that over to me, um, and potentially we can have a follow-up conversation there. All right, uh, any, go ahead. I was gonna address uh, Morlene, wrote in and, and asked when you close a work order is there a way to put you know what time the work order was completed so upkeep will automatically track the date and time at which you close that work order and in general that's that's how you determine when a work order was closed um if what you're asking is like can you sort of backdate when the work order was actually closed it is possible you just have you simply have to close the the work order first and then you can if you're an admin you can go in and you can edit the completed date Okay, and then one more. Uh, Steven asks, any plans to add the ability to transfer parts between locations using mobile? Uh, use case is warehouse to work order, van to work order. We don't have that on the roadmap right now, but definitely gets together to be useful. Um, I'll also add that to a list of things to look into. You're very welcome, Archie. Thank you. <laughs> All right, let's do last call for any last, okay, any last minute or any last questions. Is there a better way to print part labels? Uh, currently different, car, sorry, currently it is difficult getting the right side to print on the page, change the settings print and no help. So uh, I'll take a stab at this one. Um, in the last quarter, we released the avery label format for printing part labels uh so that way it's it's your standard um who don't don't quote me on it but i think it's one by five eighths and two and a quarter something like that uh the the standard avery label format 
that should, as long as you can structure that and, and have the right appropriate settings for those label formats, then you should be able to print it all within those confines. Um, so we, we definitely have that structured. Um, other than that, I, I don't think that we have any other way of altering the part, um, if that's if that's what you're asking, or altering the label. And then just because it came up, uh, Michael Harriet asked to sync upkeep inventories with SAP. And uh, we could certainly do that through our inventories or, th or, or excuse me, through our integrations or utilizing Zapier to kind of do a push and pull of each of those uh, those quantities. So certainly something, Michael, I would recommend just reach out to support and they can uh, help get you set up there. And Natasha, an interesting one about pricing packaging. You might see yeah. That reading that right now. So how about offering a pricing package for unlimited users instead of per user pricing? Um, I, we could also think of that as a, a site license um, package. It's a pretty interesting concept, Flint. Um, we don't formally offer that, but that's probably something we could work through um, with your account manager if it was something that you wanted to explore. Yeah, I will say it's pretty industry standard for CMMS to charge by uh, user, um, just because we view, you know, each kind of additional user as additional value for the company and everything. So um, definitely something we've thought about, but no media plans to offer that as like a formal um, plan type. Uh, printing QR codes. Any way to restrict the printing to my location only? I'm getting some from other locations and then have to go dig for it. So I, this is sorry, I, I, printing QR codes. And is this related to assets or parts? Either way, what you can do is from the list, you should be able to add a filter. And then uh, once you've filtered your list down, you can bulk select uh, you know, on the left-hand menu, you see those check boxes. You can bulk select that way. And you should then at the bottom see an option that says download labels. So that's kind of the way you can add a filter to the list, get the list looking like the number of parts or assets you want to, to, to get downloaded, bulk select those, and then download those. And you'll only get those particular QR codes, not kind of the whole kitchen sink. Okay, when I print a work order, why does the time show the lump sum of hours instead of hours on each day? I'm gonna guess we're just aggregating the the total hours. Yeah, on the on the PDF export there, it's just a combination there. Um, if you are looking for more delineation between those those time records, I, I believe Spencer, correct me if I'm wrong, but that can probably be done with our analytics to really yep. like actually give you more detailed reports about how that time is being logged. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. And I just want to address uh, Maureen, just another clarification there on the completed date for a, a work order if you're still out there. So when you close a work order, upkeep will automatically tag the completed date as like the time that which you move that status to complete. But you can, if you are an admin, so technicians won't be able to do this, but if you're an administrator, once you do that, you can go back into the work order and you can edit, you know, the day that, that there's a completed date. Right now, there's not multiple completed dates. So if you're looking to sort of track two different dates, one at which one date for when the work order is closed and one for when the work was completed, that's not possible. We only track one sort of complete date. Um, so you'll have to decide for yourself if you want that date to represent, you know, when the work order is closed or, or when the work itself is completed. Okay, and then maybe the last question. I'd like to be able to edit PM dates, but they are grayed out. Is that functionality or a permission thing, do we think? Uh, I That's not enough information for me to uh, r really call out what the change is here. That's probably the same thing. If you can email me, and give me the scenario of what you're trying to do and include some things such as the PMID, I can um, either myself or our support team, we can help you get through that point and, and figure out what changes need to be made. Okay, I think we've got everybody's questions in the chat. So thank you again for joining today. We'll go ahead and wrap up. Um, you will receive 
an automated or a, you'll receive a recording of today um, for future reference and it will also be posted on our website. Thanks everybody. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you.